Isaac, you're in your pajama pants, huh? Yep. <laughs> All right. So we are talking about the first presidential debate of 2020 and how climate alarmists are doubling down on uh, crazy on episode 263 of the In the Tank podcast. As always, I'm your host, Donald Kendall. Joining me today, I've got the, the full crew, the normal crew here. I got uh, Justin Haskins, editorial director at the Heartland Institute. How are you? Good, sir. Doing very well. And thank you for calling me normal. It's been a while since someone referred to me as, as normal, so that's good. Uh, I want to say a special uh, shout out to uh, to Jim Lakely. Uh, happy birthday, Jim. I don't think we've been on the air since it was 65, your birthday. 65 years yeah, young. He, he, we, finally, we, we all got together. We're going we're gonna to mail in your application for AARP. Um, so that's going to be fun. Um, that. Happy birthday. Uh, and Isaac... Uh, you're celebrating a birthday as well, isn't that true? It's uh, it's your landlord birthday. That's right. Happy birthday! <laughs> it's my land anniversary. It's your land anniversary. Yeah. Happy, uh, how and how old is uh, how old's the little guy? Uh, he's five <laughs> years old today. Nice. Five yeah. years old. That's amazing. Yeah, exactly. Well, congratulations. Um, just, just learned uh, to use the bathroom by himself. Yep. Oh, no. Nice. Wow. No more That's diapers. Sweet. Right. Sweet. Pretty That's big great. deal. Donnie knows all about that. That is a big right. deal. Um, congratulations, Isaac, on that. Um, five years in the gentry. That's great. I've been able to vote for five years. <laughs> <laughs> that's how it works, right? Yeah. That is that is how it works. That's what they tell us. That's that's on the Black Lives Matters website, I think. That's, that's how it used to work. Yep. Uh, Jim Likely, VP of the Heartland Institute. How are you good, sir? Uh, I'm doing fine. I was informed today at the age of 50, I'm now eligible for a senior coffee at McDonald's. So uh, oh. I look forward to enjoying that perk of life. And I'm sitting here with my little tiny Trump, who's ready for fighting, if they, right. ever, if they even have another debate. Justin said you were 65. No, I believe Donnie said he was 65. Someone said you were 65. Which is it? It was me. I said it. Split the difference. All right. Fine. No, no. I need every year I can get. I got to hold on for dear life here. Isaac Orr. And a half years old. Yes. Policy Come fellow on. at the center of the American experiment. Good, sir. Yes, How are you? That's true. That's, I'm good. How are you? Dude, everyone's in high spirits. You know, I think it's just a couple of weeks in a row of not being normal. And boom, got the got the in the tank crew here. And everyone's everyone's super excited. Yeah, that's what that's what happens. A couple of weeks not being on the show. The longer we're away, the happier we are. You see how it's that like, works? Yeah, your soul has time to recover. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, I guess we could just jump right into it. Uh, we have a number of ridiculous climate change stories that I want to get to, but we have to, it's kind of obligatory that we have to talk about the debate, the presidential debate. So the first debate was on Tuesday. President Donald Trump squared off with the Democratic Party or Joe Biden, he calls himself the Democratic Party, for about an hour and 45 minutes. Uh, seemed like six hours, really. Seemed really like dragged six weeks. Oh, God. So, I don't know. I guess we could just start off with general reactions to it. Uh, Jim, I want to start off with you. I, I, I'm pretty sure that we're going to have differing opinions between the four of us on how this debate went down. So I want to start off with you, Jim. What, what were your thoughts? <laughs> Well, I, I was actually, I didn't get to actually watch it live. Uh, I was busy. And when I got uh, on the way home, there was about a half an hour left to go. And I looked at my phone and there were about 50 texts in a group text between myself and you and uh, uh, the illiteracy podcast host from Heartland, uh, Tim Benson. And of course, John Noderf, who um, is a former person on this show who we're very glad is no longer on this show yeah <laughs> now Whoa. windex now windex factory manager i believe is <laughs> that's the right title. that's right so uh is he the guy in charge of making sure the kids show up to work on time which uh, kids john noter is in charge of like child labor at windex oh sure. yeah, yeah yeah i think so yeah. i think you're right about that yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Those, those that little squeeze bottle stuff doesn't get put on there except for tiny little hands perfect for it <laughs> so so, but I was looking at you guys' reaction. You guys were all ap apoplectic about how bad my man, little mini, uh, little tiny Trump here was doing against uh, little tiny, uh, J tiny Joe Biden. And I just, so I actually, I watched it. I watched a little bit of the reaction afterward on Fox News. And then I started watching it over again because I had taped it. And I was about 20 minutes in. I was 30 minutes in. And I'm like, what, 
what debate did you guys watch where you thought Trump did such a terrible job? I mean, he was crushing Trump. Yes, there was lots of interruptions. People have lost their minds. And oh, my gosh, what has happened to our democracy? We can't have two adults talking without talking over each other and throwing insults and all that stuff. Fine. When Trump was actually able to get, uh, you know, two minutes of, of verbiage without being interrupted, mostly by Chris Wallace, often by Joe Biden, <laughs> he was actually crushing uh, Joe, Joe Biden in this debate on the substance of things. So, you know, I'll be glad to defend that. But that's my initial take. I thought Trump did did well, all things considered. He could have done better. Everybody could have done better. It would have been better with less crosstalk. He probably should have let Joe Biden talk all on his own for longer stretches of time because Joe Biden would have talked himself off a cliff or into a corner, whatever cliche you want to have in there. And he didn't give Joe Biden the space to screw up. So that's a bit of a miss. But on the substance, actually, I think Trump, strange as this may sound, I think Trump was overprepared. Mm. I think I think he was there and he, he wanted to get he wanted to get across his point about uh, masks, ma mask mandates. He wanted to get his cross about the, uh, his points across about the economy. He wanted to get his points across on this and this and this other issue. And he nailed his talking points, often interrupting Joe Biden to do so. He would have been better if he just laid back. One of the things that is that Trump's fans love are his rallies. I mean, I just watched it the day after the uh, the debate. He was in Minnesota, not near your neck of the woods, uh, Isaac, but way up in Duluth. And he was his usual laid back, happy self, having fun. That's the Trump that Trump supporters and frankly, you know, anybody that's undecided wants to see. Instead, they saw kind of angry, defensive Trump. And to and in, uh, you know, in all fairness, he was defensive because it was two on one as usual at a debate like that. So everyone that is watching this on YouTube, put a comment uh, below this video telling us what you think and uh, whether or not you think Trump won. If you agree with Jim, Isaac, did you did you watch the debate? No. Okay, good. We'll just take a seat, you know, just enjoy the conversation <laughs> we'll you later. for a while. I will. Yeah, we'll get back to you. Justin, I think you were a little bit more uh, sharing my beliefs on how the how the debate went. What, what do you think? Um. So I thought it was a train wreck. <laughs> um, I think it was a train wreck for everybody, in fairness. I don't think that anybody came across well in the debate. I think everyone came across horribly. Um, Joe Biden, to me, Joe Biden seemed to me as though he was like an old man wandering the aisles of a grocery store who then gets into a horrible, horrible fight with, I don't know, like some, some person at the checkout aisle or something. <laughs> Except it goes on for like an hour and a half. <laughs> and, and you're standing and, behind them waiting to go to the I've got a for Chris Wallace checks, is the guy right? standing behind them just hoping that he can get out, but he can't. You know, he just wants this like dispute to end and it won't end. Um, <laughs> it was just like, it was just, I mean, Joe Biden sounded horrible. I thought, I thought he, he, he seemed ancient in every way. He seemed frustrated by everything that Trump was doing. Uh, could not get a point across because Trump wouldn't let him. Uh, I don't think that's really a compliment for Trump. It came across as not not really bullying so much as just uh, just relentless, just relentless like, harassment, I think is like <laughs> <laughs> probably the best way to describe it. And Trump definitely came across as the stronger personality. Joe Biden seemed, you know, like like he was helpless um, in many respects. Right. Yeah. It just totally helpless. Um, but uh, Jim mentioned the substance. Uh, I don't think there was, I, I don't think anyone got any substance out of this. I think it was Wrong. impossible. I think what? it was impossible for anyone to be impacted by the substance of anyone's argument, because the only thing that you could do as a viewer uh, was, is is well cr kind of cringe more so just just like shake your head in despair for the future of this country like these are the two best people that we could find to to have a conversation about the f about America they're just screaming well, okay. at each other relentlessly so, i mean it it was i don't think you could, i guess i guess this is my point the only takeaway if you're a middle of the road voter who's trying to make up your mind the only takeaway that you could walk away from this is that these two guys hate each other and that they won't let each other talk. And that was pretty much it. I don't think you could get any substance out of it because it was just too distracting, all of the interruptions and yelling and fighting and the bickering with Chris Wallace and all of that. So I think that that's the most important takeaway. I don't think it helped anybody for that reason, but I also think that it just 
if anything, it discouraged people from voting at all. So I, you know, I've said on this podcast a number of times, I'm a humongous fan of Donald Trump, right? Humongous fan. I've been saying that for a long time. Um, his, I've been watching some of his rallies that he's been doing in various states, uh, just like on YouTube over the past couple of weeks in the lead up to this debate. And I would think that like a middle of the road person that just like watches one of these rallies, I think they would be more persuaded into like, yeah, you know, Trump's not a crazy person. Like, yeah, I can get behind some of the stuff that he's saying. Like, he's not that bad that the media is trying to paint him to be. I don't think that people would have that reaction if they're watching Trump during this debate. I don't think he's winning over any middle of the road people. Uh, I don't think that he, you know, got any of his base upset by any means. Uh, but I don't think that he's winning over any votes. No, it well, it's impossible. How can you win over people when you're all you're doing is interrupting the other person? I mean, it just comes. It just again, if you were a middle of the road person who didn't know who you were going to vote for, how did this help you make your decision? Like how? And, and I don't mean I mean that from the Joe from Joe Biden's perspective too. Like Joe Biden didn't win anybody over. I mean, nobody won anyone over in this. If anything, you watch this and you're like, if you didn't know who to vote for when you came into it, you came out of it thinking, I don't know who to vote for. Like, I, I may not even vote because this was a total train wreck. I, I think that's the only, I don't know, Jim, I Jim. really, truly don't understand how you could think that this was anything but a train wreck. I just, that's the unanimous view of, every, it's not just us, well, Jim, Jim, it's everyone. Feel, feel free to respond to that, or we can start going through one of these policy areas kind of one at a time and dissecting it a little bit. I mean, look, it was, it was a, it was a train wreck, but it was like a mutual train wreck. Everybody's blaming the whole train wreck that like Trump was the only one is the only conductor and nobody else was involved. They were all just passengers on the, on the Trump train wreck during this debate. That's just not the case. I mean, Joe Biden, uh, I saw somewhere where, where Donald Trump was interrupted by either Chris Wallace or Joe Biden 77 times. And Chris Wallace um, interrupted Biden something like five times and, and Trump more than that. But it was the, 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 the metrics were very much in the sense that Trump was the one who was getting interrupted more often. In fact, yeah, because first he was person, talking the most often. <laughs> no, the first actually the first person to interrupt anyone was Biden interrupting Donald Trump right at the very beginning. I mean, I, you watch the first five minutes. It's actually a very nice debate. But I'll just get back to some of the points that I mean, I guess we'll get into this if you're going to talk about some of the substantive topics that were brought up. Yeah. I know we're going to talk about the climate change stuff. But look, Trump got a, got across a, a couple of really great messages. Trump said, I have these in my notes. He said, quote, he wants to shut down this country. I want to keep it open. That's an outstanding point. And it was able to get out there if people were listening instead of being distracted by a so-called train wreck. I mean, that's a huge message. There's a lot of people that want to get the company open. And it's true that Biden wants to have the country, uh, you know, basically closed down. Trump made fun of I thought it was a very, actually very fun moment when Trump made fun of Joe Biden for, um, you know, standing almost every campaign event. If you want to call it that he's standing in the middle of a field with a mask on with nobody within 200 yards of him. I mean, <laughs> it's it's or two as Trump said, 200 feet of him. It's like this is silly he was painting a picture of a man who was basically scared to campaign as as versus himself who um you know who is out there campaigning every single day but just to so i thought he made a lot of great points i thought i think actually think he made a points about public safety and about the the uh the chaos in the streets that the democrats will not condemn he was very strong on personal you know on public safety which is very important to those you know what they call now safety moms in the suburbs he did say many things that should have been very appealing to them but uh, just one last point about Chris Wallace, who was such a such a disaster. This guy's got such an ego. He has to put himself um, into every situation. But, you know, he he came at Trump for, you know, so-called not not condemning white supremacy with the assumption that somehow all this time Trump has been in support of white supremacy and has been boosting up white supremacists in this country. It that That is absurd. It's, it's actually an insult. But if you're going to ask that, how about you ask Joe Biden about him saying that, um, you know, you ain't black. How about he asked Joe Biden about his vice presidential candidate um, donating and promoting a, a bail fund for rioters in the streets? How about asking Joe Biden um, if why he gave a eulogy and if he will denounce himself for his eulogy at the uh, at the funeral for Senator Robert Byrd, who is a uh, grand legal in the KKK for crying out loud? 
All right. You know, how about how about asking why it's taken your campaign and the Democrats in general months, four months, five months to say anything, to even lift a little tiny pinky finger in opposition to the chaos and the rioting in the streets? No questions on that. You know, and then, of course, he didn't even press Chris Wallace didn't even press Joe Biden on basically endorsing and rejecting the Green New Deal in the span of about 10 seconds. I mean, so 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 I can understand Donald Trump's instinct to fight and to and to get in people's faces during the debate because he was being ganged up on by not only the, the his vice presidential or his presidential opponent in Joe Biden, but also Chris Wallace. The, the 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 tone and the way Chris Wallace handled this was against Trump from the beginning. So I'm sorry. I give him a little bit of slack for being a little combative. So look, look. It- in maybe a, maybe a hundred percent of the presidential elections that have occurred over the past 50 years, the more likable candidate personality wise wins. Okay. In almost every single one, there may be no exceptions to that rule. The more likely personality or the more likable personality wins. And the reason for that is because most people who are middle of the road, really either don't understand the policy, don't care about the policy, or have differing policy ideas that are so conflicted that they have to choose based on some other factor, okay? Mm -hmm. And because of that, they're basing their decisions on personality. They're not basing it on all of these other things. Most of them don't follow politics very closely normally, and so they don't understand the, the context of the vast majority of the things that you just Reference. They don't get it. They want to vote for someone who makes them feel good, who they trust, who they like. Like it's about personality. And what Donald, the reason Donald Trump has had so much trouble in his presidency, in a in from a media perspective, is because he plays right into all of the criticisms and things that the left says. Many of them are very unfair, but he plays right into it with his personality, with his Twitter rants, with all of that sort of stuff. And what he did on that debate stage was play into it more than he has ever played into it in his entire presidency by getting up on the stage and being basically a jerk. Like that was his personality. (laughs) And that, and, and because he did that, if you were watching it and you thought, well, Donald Trump's a bad guy, Donald Trump is, uh, you know, he's, he's heartless. And some people have heard rumors that he might be a racist. And if you don't know anything about him, you don't know anything about his background. You don't know anything about his policies. And that's all, you know, is superficial stuff. What did he do on that debate stage to make you feel better about him personally as a human being? Nothing, nothing. He didn't make himself more likable. He made himself less likable. And then you brought up the white supremacy thing. When they asked him a question about white supremacy, how hard is it to just say, no, I totally disavow white supremacists. It's ridiculous. Why doesn't he just say that? No, instead he had to stumble over his words and ask all these, you know, well, wh- who do you, exactly do you mean? Like, give well, me a specific group. Like, yeah. why did he have to do that? He he literally played into every stereotype about him that the left is always using. He, it, he absolutely played right into it. And because of that, I don't think that it could be a win for him. It, Joe Biden didn't look good either. I understand that. But the substance doesn't matter to the middle of the road person watching a presidential debate. What matters is personality. That's why Barack Obama won, despite the fact that his policies were trash for eight years. They voted for him anyway. Why? Because they liked his personality. They believed in the vision. Donald Trump did not present anything remotely close to something that people want to be a part of who aren't already a part of it. Mm -hmm. If you like that kind of thing, if you like what Donald Trump presented personality wise, presentation wise, you're already a Trump supporter. Right. So who is he winning over with that kind of presentation? That's the question that matters in a presidential. Well, what you're saying there is exactly what I was talking about when I said like that people to, if they were to watch his rallies, like his personality, like coming through there when he's talking to like the people, I think he could win over somebody that's the middle of the road when he's talking like that. I agree. But, but yeah, the way that it would happen this time, I'm going to have to agree with Justin on this. Um, well, we, like, sh- like, we, we should get to some of these specific things though. And, and we can circle back and you can make your final statements. Just, just to add something to that uh, in support of what Justin was saying, 
uh, Taco Bell was voted the most or like the best Mexican food restaurant in the United States, <laughs> right? Like that's what we're dealing with. That's when like when everyone's like, oh, we need more people to vote. And then they like don't get why <laughs> they we have really this bad is an options. excellent point. This is an excellent point, Isaac. <laughs> Go ahead. Keep going. But it's like, okay, well, that's great that you've like asked a lot of people to participate in this. But like then you're like surprised when the result is Taco Bell is the best Mexican food. Like, well, it's not terrible. Uh, no, but we I should mean, move it's, on. So Supreme it's Court good enough to support hundreds of chains, right? But like if you're gonna say that's the best, like that's what happens when you ask a whole bunch of people to give you their opinion. You get something that isn't very good. <laughs> All right, so they talked about the Supreme Court, and uh, you know nothing too crazy here, unless I missed something, except for uh, when Trump had to specifically ask him about uh, packing the court, and Biden just basically sidestepped the question. And I think he actually—I don't think he sidestepped it. I think he directly said, "I'm not going to answer that That's question." Right. Yep. So that was that was pretty astounding, and that happened within the first like 20 minutes of the sh- of the. Uh, I was going to say the show, but of the debate. In fact, in fact, the only worthy questions that Joe Biden got, the only tough questions he got were from uh, Donald Trump himself. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's one of the reasons why he had to keep interrupting is because Chris Wallace wasn't going to ask him any of these questions. And actually, Chris Wallace should have followed up by pressing him on this. What do you mean you're not going to answer this question? This one, it would be a right. profoundly uh, significant change. It would change America forever. Right. This is, I mean, this is a huge deal. And you won't even say whether or not you are in favor or against yeah, um, that what your party crazy. wants to do and pack the Supreme Court. And you know what that means? He's in favor of it. Yeah. That's what that, he is. I, and, you know, and we kind of went, we went over this last week, you know, and his kind of stumbling and saying that he's not going to answer that question last week. And the fact that he would say it on the stage like this, to me, I agree with you, Jim. I think he is in favor of it. I, I, I totally agree. And that was, in a lot of ways, Chris Wallace tipping his hands tipping his hand that he's that he's completely biased <laughs> because any moderator put in that position who's fair would absolutely force Joe Biden to answer to, to, to clarify his answer to that question because it's not just that it would radically change the 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 country in from a you know adding Supreme Court seats is is unprecedented it essentially never happens um but not only is it important for that reason it literally could trigger a civil war type thing, like a secession from the right. country. It sure. could. It legitimately could. Because if Democrats think that what they're going to do is just, okay, well, you guys control the Supreme Court for a few months. Now we take over uh, the government. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to add uh, five Supreme Court justices and we're going to pick them all right now. How about right. that? Right. If, if they think that that's just going to happen and everyone's just going to say, oh, okay, I guess so. Fine. Like that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen because everyone's been playing under the same rules forever. And now all of a sudden, after you guys lose your control over the Supreme court for the first time since the Roosevelt administration, (laughs) you don't like it. And now you're going to throw a hissy fit and change the rules because the rules aren't working very well for you anymore. And you think everyone on the other side is just going to sit back and say, well, I guess we just have to live with this. No, that's not going to happen. It would be, catastrophic for the future of this country it literally could it would totally and completely undermine whatever faith what little faith remains in government in the federal government it would totally erode it and it could i i I literally mean this I, i don't think this is an exaggeration i really do think it could be the end of america if you just add a bunch of supreme court seats and expect everyone to just live with the consequences right. of that action. Well, yeah. Um, so, so yeah. So do you have to, as the moderator, ask Joe Biden a question about this? Yeah, you do. You have to force him to answer that question. Are you going to do it or not? Answer the question. And if he continues to refuse, you keep pressing him until he answers it or until it's so obvious that he's not going to answer it because the answer is yes. Uh, that's what you have to do as the moderator. And he didn't do that. Isaac, another Taco Bell analogy. Uh, yeah. Um, so no, I don't, uh, but, <laughs> see, you uh, see, see, you see, Chris Wallace is the Chalupa, right? And then <laughs> Trump is the Taco Supreme. Go ahead, Isaac. Fill that well, out. you're Fill turning it into the, the dollar, the $10 box deal, right? Oh, like, right. Um, but if you do pack the court, like then the next time the Republicans are in power, they're going to repack it. Like, right. 
we're going to have point, 90 like, Supreme no, Court justices. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, and, but th- but this is the thing. This is what Democrats are saying. They're saying they're not only going to pack the Supreme Court, they're saying they're going to pack the Supreme Court and they're going to add two new states to the union, okay? Which means you're going to add four Democrat senators because the two places they're talking about adding states are Puerto Rico and Washington. That's four Democrats mm-hmm. they're adding to the Senate. The Republicans are never going to get control of the government ever again at that rate. I mean, it could be 30 years before they get the Senate again. That's the whole point. That's what they're trying to do. Chuck Schumer is even saying that he's he's going to end the filibuster on a bunch of things in the Senate. So they're going to pack the Supreme Court. They're going to add four Senate seats for Democrats. And then after they do all of that, um, they're going to put in a whole bunch of, of Supreme Court seats that benefit them and will rubber stamp all of their actions that they're taking. How is it that America is going to survive that? I mean, I don't think it's going to be like, a OK, well, you guys are packing the Supreme Court this time. We're going to pack it next time, which, by the way, if that were to happen, would totally undermine what the Supreme Court is supposed to be because right. everyone's just going to assume that in four years, whatever it is now could disappear. Yeah. But it will also cause a panic within the Republican party and conservatism in general, that this is the end of America and the end of our constitution. And that the constitution really does mean whatever the sitting president thinks it means in the Congress, because they can just add Supreme court seats, whenever they want. And it will just create total panic and, and undermine what little faith remains in the federal government. It, mm-hmm. I do think it's the end of America. That's the end of America. Well, the, yeah. the, irony, the irony here is that is that we've been told by the Democrats and the left and our mainstream media betters for three years that Donald Trump himself, his very existence, his administration is a threat to the Constitution, a threat to democracy. We're a republic, not a democracy, but we get what they're saying, that he, just him existing, just him being in power is a vital, is a, is a grave threat to the Constitution. While at the same time, they would completely destroy the Constitution, which is there to ensure separation of powers. The Senate has a filibuster because it's supposed to be the cooling uh, dish to to hot to the hot cup of tea from from the House of Representatives. You know, it's supposed to be a deliberate process to protect our, our rights and protect our liberties. And the, and the Democrats right now, right now, if they were to get complete control of if if if. If uh, Joe Biden wins the presidency and they take back the Senate by just one seat, they'll eliminate the filibuster and keep the House. It's all over. It's all over. There are no checks on anything. Zero. And uh, this is that is a real threat to to our country, as you just said, Justin. I really think America, certainly as we know, it would be over forever. And any limits on government power would also be just completely scotched. Yeah, and they just kind of let Joe Biden slide on that. Let's move on. Yeah, let's, let's not even on. answer that. So they moved on to COVID. And this Can they just a- add two states like that, though? Yeah. They could add really? it just like... Answer. Just like they can add something to the dollar menu at Taco Bell, man. They could just. It's that easy. It's that, um, easy. that easy. Not no, just it, Supreme. It, 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 all they need to do essentially is just have control of Congress and they can add two states. They don't need two thirds or something I, I like thought, that. I think no. You need two thirds. No. No, you don't. No, you don't. It's just it's just an act of Congress. That's it. You would need. Normally, it's it's what makes it so difficult historically is that. If you have a, if you're taking a piece of a state and you're making it into a new state, which is often how these things have been done historically, then you need that state to agree to to give up that part of it, right? So if you, when Virginia, when West Virginia was created, for example, right, you would need Virginia to agree to do that. Historically speaking, that's what you would need. But because in this case, neither are part of an existing state, you don't need that. So all you need is for those people in those areas to say, yes, we want to be a state, which Washington, D.C. has already done, and Puerto Rico has already done, although they would probably have to do it again in Puerto Rico. And then Congress just approves it, and now you have a state. Yeah, I mean, well, West Virginia left Virginia because, well, we were under civil war. And so Correct. Virginia was not it was not technically part of the That's United true. States anymore. So uh, West Virginia said, we're joining the Union. Come stop in, us. In, maybe, uh, maybe we'll fight. Maybe you'll have to fight to keep us from leaving. Well, well we're already in the middle of one. That's true. So Ten- Tennessee would have been a better example. You're yeah. exactly right. Yes, Tennessee. A lot, of st- a lot of the states that have been created were created out of other states or territories or things like that. And you, you know, but yes, all you need is for Congress to say, yep, you're a state. As long as these people in that area agree and it doesn't conflict with some other state right and it doesn't in these cases. So, yeah. Well, this just confirms my firmly held opinion that uh, Trump needs to annex Alberta and Saskatchewan into 
America as soon mm -hmm. as possible. <laughs> right. Alberta is basically the Texas of Canada. That would be a huge win for the United States. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. We'll take them. They have a uh, giant rodeo called the Calgary Stampede. It's like one of the largest rodeos in the whole world. And the people up there, they just get drunk for a whole week. <laughs> All right. Sounds like right Wisconsin. <laughs> Yeah. All right, so they talked about COVID. We already kind of talked about COVID, so I'm going to gloss over that just because we're already running so l much longer on this topic than I thought we would. I'll go right to climate change. So this was actually, I think, the spot where I thought Trump did the best. Uh, he talked about the climate, the Paris Climate Accord. He talked about how the 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 fires in California were due mostly to forest m mismanagement. Um, and then even when he was like talking about like, do you believe that uh, humans participate or, or, you know, contribute to global warming? He's like, to an extent, sure, maybe. But, you know, let's get back to clean air and clean water. So I really thought that he did pretty great uh, when it came to that. Jim or Justin, do you uh, disagree? Well, we already know what Jim's going to say. <laughs> He's going to say that Trump was great. Um, you so might be and that his he boots taste the best. You know, no, they're no, the best boots that of I've all ever the boots. Tasted. Yeah, of all the boots, that's the best tasting one. <laughs> um, I will, what I, what I will say is, uh, I, I actually, I sort, I sort of agree. I, I think he did. You know what? No, I agree completely. Of all the, if we're talking relatively speaking, um, I thought that that was one of his best sections. Yes. Um, okay. I think if I were, I, I think that there were. Let's just move on. How about no, that? Well, well, right, but so. there were, but there were some. I, I think what he said about the Green New Deal relative to Biden, I thought Biden obviously uh, contradicted himself. A lot of people know this. He said he wasn't for the Green New Deal, but he also said he was for the Green New Deal. He was confused, clearly. Um, he's not for the Green New Deal, according to his website. I thought that Trump's statements about the Green New Deal were very conf were, were inaccurate. Um, he continued to tell... Uh, Joe, he continued to suggest that Joe Biden supported a $100 trillion Green New Deal plan, which is totally false. Joe Biden has never supported a $100 trillion Green New Deal plan. He his his plan is not nearly as expensive as that. The $100 trillion that he was that Trump was referring to is an estimate, a high end of an estimate taken by the American action forum of the AOC green new deal. And the mm -hmm. reason why it's so high is because of all of the social programs. Medicare in for it. all uh, exactly. payments for people who are jobs unwilling. Guarantee. Yeah. Jobs yeah. Unwilling the, to work. Yeah. Right. A federal exactly. jobs guarantee is actually the most expensive part of the American action forums estimate. And Joe Biden doesn't support a, a federal jobs guarantee. So, Yet. well, he might, but the point loud. is, <laughs> okay come on justin didn't okay. you see didn't you see the little earpiece in joe biden's ear along with the microphone <laughs> hidden up his sleeve yeah, and then, and then the i thought you didn't watch this isaac i thought he saw no, the instagram I just, I just saw like unhinged people like saying all this stuff i'm like he's 77 is probably a hearing aid <laughs> yeah. yeah well that's probably true but the the bottom line is I thought that Trump did a good job answering the questions about climate change, but I thought he was f completely factually incorrect when he started accusing well, Joe Biden about all with of a, these things related to well, this. Andy, pull up that thing deal. that you just had, because he's painting with kind of a broad brush. Like, it, to some extent, all of the Democrats have, have had sounded some type of support for the Green New Deal. So this is JoeBiden.com backslash climate plan, right? So go slash back come on part. man <laughs> slash come on man it says biden believes the green new deal ah uh, i can't read it now what are you doing biden believes the green new deal drops, Andy. just do your job is a crucial framework for meeting the climate cha challenges we face this is on his website so yep. donald trump's not completely wrong i mean he rounded no, up yeah, to no, no 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 he's hold on, hold moving on, on. he is moving on he is totally wrong joe biden in this climate plan says how much it costs in this plan and it's not a hundred trillion dollars and the and the reason that trump gave for why his climate plan will really cost a hundred trillion dollars is because he accused him of supporting a plan that requires him to build rebuild every building as though that's the reason why it's going to cost $100 trillion. That's not true. That's that's not true even by the American, Act, the American Action Forum's own estimates. That's not the reason why AOC's Green New Deal costs $100 trillion. The reality is 
Trump was totally wrong. It was completely false what he said about Joe Biden and the Green New Deal. It's just, it just is. There's no question about it. Now, Joe so, Biden was confused about his own support for the Green New Deal too. So, you know, you can kind of forgive right, want, Trump want, a little bit for that, but come on. I want one last question here uh, to kind of go around. And that is, A, will another debate happen? And B, will Trump change his tactics? Let's go with Jim. Wait, I don't get to talk about what he said on climate? No. Why not? Ha, we're, we're only 30, 35, we're 35 minutes, minutes in. We, we've we're got a whole gonna... other topic to talk about. Oh, we do have a whole other topic? I didn't know we had another topic to talk about. Uh, actually, I just saw today that uh, Donald Trump says he does not agree to the new rules that the uh, the geriatric uh, commission on presidential debates is now implemented. I think one of the rules they had was that if you go, if you go over your time, we're going to cut your mic off. Ugh. And Donald Trump said, no, I'm not agreeing to those rules. Uh, so they're trying to change the rules in the middle of the game to deal with Donald Trump. What a shock. <laughs> uh, you know, he is the change agent. People must deal with him. Uh, I actually think despite all of this, there will be all the debates are going to go on a schedule. That's my prediction. Well, OK, so uh, um, Justin, do you want to do you want to add on to that? So I, I would, if you had asked this question to me immediately after the debate, I would say, I would have said there's no way that another debate would happen and that they actually gave Biden a perfect excuse for getting out because yeah. Trump harassed him so much during the debate. Aww. All Biden has to say is the guy won't, the guy won't allow us to have a reasonable conversation. I'm out of here. Yeah. And, and, yep. and it was a good excuse for him. And a lot of people on the left were urging him not to agree to have another debate. So it would have been a perfect excuse. And uh, however, I think that it probably will happen because I think that the Biden people believe that that debate helped him. I'm not yep. sure that it did, but I think that's what they believe because Trump got up there and and bullied him. And that's that's and I think they think that that helped him. So I think they might go out there again anyway, just to take more abuse from Trump <laughs> because, they th because they think that that's helping them. Yeah. However, I think that next time Trump will not be as aggressive as he was this time. Um, and I think that his tactics will change and he will be more reserved. And if you go back and watch the debates he had with Hillary Clinton, they were much more reserved than what we saw this time. And I think that it will be more like that because I think Trump's handlers are going to say to him, hey, it didn't work. That strategy didn't work. Right. You got to tone it down a little bit and let him talk. So I do think there will be another debate. And I, and I think that Biden's plan will backfire and Trump will actually be a little more reserved and do better next time than he did this time. Is that next week or is that two weeks from now? It's two weeks from now. Next week is the VP debate. No, the that VP nobody debate. will care about. So yeah, yeah. that's yeah. <laughs> forget that's that me. one. Yeah. All right. All right. I want to talk about climate change stuff here. What about my opinion, Donnie? You didn't watch the debate. What are you going to say? Oh yeah. It's going to change based on me not watching it. <laughs> I agree yeah, with right. Justin. Okay, good. All right, so let's move on to climate change stuff. So a few weeks ago, maybe it was a month ago, I don't know, time goes by way too fast. We talked about the rolling blackouts in California. And this was caused by their increasing reliance on green energy, uh, wind and solar, right? So millions of in California had their power shut off to kind of lessen the burden on the electric grid. So I came across an article recently from the Competitive Enterprise Institute titled California's Rolling Blackouts Cast Further Doubt on Electric Vehicles Future. So this was an August 20th article, so it's almost a month old. The article explains how plans like the Green New Deal have aspirations of replacing every combustion engine vehicle with an electric vehicle alternative in a relatively short time span. The plans also call for increased use of green energy for obvious reasons, but also to ensure that these electric vehicles are more carbon neutral, you know, and they're not getting powered up by coal or anything like that. So the article goes on to explain that how an all electric fleet of cars would put far more strain on an already overburdened energy grid in California. The article ends by explaining that the recent blackouts in California show that the ambitious and boneheaded plans have no real footing in reality. Fast forward to last week, where on September 23rd, California Governor Gruesome Newsom signed an executive <laughs> order that will ban the sale of new gasoline and diesel powered cars and trucks in California in the next 15 years. It was like comedic timing almost on some of this. So, Isaac, good idea or great idea? Best idea. <laughs> Greatest idea ever. Uh, the Babylon Bee had a great article. Um, it's one of those times when the Babylon Bee just was like, we can't, we don't even know how to spoof this. It's like, <laughs> yeah. 
governor of state with no electricity mandates cars that run solely on electricity. <laughs> it's, just, it's just insane, man. Like, yeah, it was I, like you could have, you know, taken this time to reevaluate what was working or wasn't working and maybe changed your plan. But like they just doubled down. And uh, like, I, I don't remember who I was reading on Twitter because this is an original thought by me. But they said, like, if the governor thinks that banning electric cars is going to stop uh, these forest fires, then he's completely lost it. Mm -hmm. Like, you can't think that those two things are like a one for one relationship. You just can't. Um, right. Jim, so, yeah. Jim, I mean, you lived in California. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I, whenever I think that they kind of, uh, they've reached the limit of craziness, they seem to outdo themselves. Is that just uh, something in the water down there or what? It's something in the politics in California. Uh, when I lived there in the mid aughts, uh, there was still a Republican party of California that had some power. Um, you know, I actually, I moved there. I think, yeah, governor, um, Schwarzenegger was a Republican with quotes around it in, as the governor of California. And there were still, you know, he brought some other Republicans with him in the state legislature. But for, I don't know, I think I'd have to say at least three, four years now, the state of California has a super majority of Democrats. And so they can do whatever the hell they want. And these are not your, you know, Iowa Democrats or even Minnesota Democrats. These are hard leftist Marxist Democrats right. in California. I mean, what's so what you're seeing actually is this is you're seeing in California what the whole nation will become if, um, you know, if the left gets a hold of the whole country, if 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 Joe Biden is president and they uh, and they take the Senate and the House, this is the, what you see, the disaster that is the failed state. That is the third world country that California has become is what is in store for this entire country because they've been able to do whatever they want. And so they do they can just do things. It's not just even this legislature that passes uh, silly, ridiculous laws. But the idea that the, that gruesome Newsom, I like that. That's a great thing. <laughs> the, the, the idea that he could just sign an executive order saying no more sale of ordinary regular cars starting in 15 years. Uh, that's the kind of hubris you get when you have basically one party control for so long you think that you can do whatever you want um the the uh, andrew wheeler the uh, administrator of the environmental protection agency the us epa sent a letter to gavin newsom uh, i think the day or two days after he made his his silly uh, executive order saying uh hold on a second Mm. Uh, I don't think that's going to be constitutional. That will certainly be challenged in court. Mm. You cannot set basically uh. national policy for the country with an executive order, let alone, uh, you know, something that you would sign into law. You know, what do you do if somebody buys a, uh, I guess dealerships are going to pop up, you know, regular dealerships are going to pop up all across the Nevada border and the Arizona border and the Oregon border so that people can go and buy a regular car. And then turn around and drive it home uh, well, wait. because he's we he can only ban the sale of it. So, but it's actually so. What happens? You know, what happens if you have a car? Um, does that get phased out later? Do they make you sell it? Um, this is this. Th there's so many problems with this, and it, it just comes from the idea that I'm on the left. I am never wrong. I am infallible, and you will do what I say for your own good. Damn it! Um, that's not the kind of government any real American wants to live under, and that's one of the reasons why I left California. So oh, I mean. I Go ahead, Donnie. I was <laughs> going to say something mean. Go ahead. Uh, an executive order. So couldn't just like theoretically the next governor just kind of undo it? Yeah, but who's going to do that? It's California. Yeah. <laughs> what is, you know, California Ronald is a failed state. Do you it think is. it'll be one of these things where the deadline just keeps getting pushed back and back? No, and back? I think it'll get moved up. Really? Anything. Oh, yeah. Wow. I mean, like right now, pushing something... Nobody would have thought like last year that he'd have an executive order saying 2035 is the year. So I think that they'll actually they'll actually try to move it up. Maybe maybe they'll move it back once they realize that they're not actually going to hit the target. But um, really, all they need to do is stop selling them in California. You can still have them. That's like that's, that's the, the rub here. But I, I kind of tend to believe that that's going to have it's like asterisks as well, like you're not going to be able to buy a car with fewer than 5,000 miles outside of the state of California and right. bring it back. Like right. in Minnesota, we're trying, or our brilliant governor is trying to adopt California's current emission standards. Um, and that also has rules like that, where, you know, you have to have like at least, I don't remember what the, the mileage is on the car, but the state of Minnesota will not allow you to register a vehicle that was bought outside of the state 
if it has more than um, or if it has fewer than X number of miles and mm -hmm. does not meet Minnesota's new gas mileage requirements. So yeah, yeah, this is this is all this is what Jim was right. Um, and like, there's nothing liberating about liberals today. Like it's all nanny state crap. Like people used to watch easy rider and be like, oh yeah, th that's all for freedom. And now it's just like, no, don't do that. You might hurt yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, okay. uh, your your article that you just referenced there actually gave me pause because whenever I read about some crazy policy proposal in California, I just kind of laugh. Just think, oh, crazy California. Can't wait for you to secede with your new grand premier, you know, Joe Biden or something like that at some point. But reading your article where I was talking about uh, Governor Tim Waltz and uh, how he wanted to basically adopt some of these mandates that are in California. And it kind of just shows, it highlighted to me that some of these like terrible proposals that maybe they pop up in California or Illinois or New York or something like that, they have this like malignant nature to them and it can infect other, uh, you know, other States across the country. So yeah, your article was pretty insightful there. I, I, I think Justin, do you want to jump in on any of this? You are muted. Um, well, I'll jump in while Justin's muted. Um, <laughs> There's a there's a really interesting case. Uh, there's an assemblyman. Uh, he's a black uh, Democrat from California. His name is Jim Cooper, and he's actually been a very big critic of this move, as well as uh, all the you know renewable energy mandates, because he understands how regressive that they are. Sure. So it's interesting that there's starting to be some pushback even on the left um, from from the actual end results of this. It's just a question of are they going to get listened to? Gotcha. Yeah. So I think that what we're seeing in California is actually incredibly important for a variety of reasons. But I think the biggest reason is that California is experiencing an exodus of reasonable people. <laughs> yeah. Okay. The Joe reasonable, Rogan's gone. They, the they're, they're screwed. <laughs> anyone who's even remotely reasonable is starting to leave Cal. If they have the financial ability to leave California, if they don't have some anchor holding them there like for instance you know as, as an elderly parent or something like that you know something that they just can't escape the vast a lot of people an increasingly larger number of people are escaping california they're they're leaving the state and as they leave the state what it's what it's doing is it's creating it, it's 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 making the far left completely unreasonable people running california even more powerful because the only people who remain are the people who are allies or, or supporters or or whatever of of the craziest people? So only the crazy people or the people who are for some reason allied with them or behold to them or dependent on them in some fashion are staying in California, and so California is becoming increasingly more radicalized uh, by the fact that the reasonable people are all leaving, and as this continues to progress what you're going to get is an even more radical version of California. Now, normally when you see this kind of thing in business or in really in, in the vast majority of, of life, what happens is, is whatever that entity is that is experiencing talented people leaving or reasonable people leaving or whatever is it collapses, right? And then when it collapses, there's an opportunity for that thing to be repaired. But in the case of California, because it's being subsidized by the federal government. It's being kept alive and propped up by the federal government, infusing it with cash and everything else. California and the federal government is itself printing trillions of dollars. It doesn't have in order to do these kinds of things. California is going to be propped up. It's going to be kept alive. And these horrible ideas are going to continue getting increasingly worse. Now, Maybe that doesn't matter to you because maybe you're listening to this show or watching this show or whatever. You don't live in California. So who cares? The problem is it's not just happening in California. It's happening in other places all over the country. And the people who are leaving California, although they are reasonable, many of them, a portion of them, are also people willing to vote for other for the same kinds of people that ruined California, except now they're leaving California and they're going to other places. And the real question of this century in America is, are those people who leave places like California who are, are inclined to vote for the people who ruined California going to learn their lesson and vote for different people? Or are they going to vote for the same kinds of people in the new states that they move to and ruin those places too? 
that is that is going to shape the future of this country. Right. And unfortunately, I am terrified that all these people who are leaving California who are reasonable and moving to places <laughs> like Texas, because Texas is a much more reasonable place to live, are going to ruin Texas. And then they're going to ruin, you know, uh, Wyoming and Montana right. and everywhere else in the we West. We already talked about this. Wyoming doesn't exist. Well, right. There's one more article that I want to get to here, but your all point right. is but the well point, made. The point is... California is in a downward spiral and their failures are potentially going to set off a domino effect. That's going to ruin a whole bunch of other places. And just, one, right. just, just one other quick thing about the, the reason this is important and you should care about it, even if you don't live in California is that there are national uh, California set its own standards for the fuel efficiency of vehicles and the manufacturers of automobiles in this country and around the world thought, well, those are higher than everything else. We need to meet these. We can sell everywhere else after we meet this. It's either that or give up California as a market. And so these sorts of that's why Gavin Newsom is so confident that he can change the world by changing California because because uh, it's such a large market. He figures the rest of the United States are going to have to follow behind. Right. Yeah. No, that that is a very, very important point there. Uh, I do want to get to one other topic because I think that this is kind of an insight into what the future of this whole climate change debate whatever topic is. So this is an article that is, uh, it was actually published in a number of places, but it's titled Avoiding a Climate Lockdown. So the author starts off saying, as COVID-19 spread earlier this year, governments introduced lockdowns in order to prevent a public health emergency from spinning out of control. In the near future, the world may need to resort to lockdowns again, this time to tackle a climate emergency. Shifting Arctic ice, raging wildfires in the Western United States and elsewhere, and methane leaks in the North Sea are all warning signs that we are approaching a tipping point on climate change when protecting the future of civilization will require traumatic interventions. Under a climate lockdown, governments would limit private vehicle use, ban consumption of red meat, and impose extreme energy-saving measures, while fossil fuel companies would have to stop drilling. To avoid such a scenario, we must overhaul our economic structures and do capitalism differently. So doesn't this just sound great? This is, this is, this is the reality that I think is going to be increasingly talked about. I honestly think that COVID was kind of a test run for this type of operations, you know? If we're going to be able to convince the public to do this type of stuff because of COVID, then we could do it over a potentially, you know, end uh, world ending event like climate change. So, yeah, I think that this is the future. We're going to see more and more of this talk over the next five years. Uh, Jim, do you think I'm I'm overextending here? No, you're not. You're not crazy for once. That's comforting <laughs> to me. No, right, I mean, shut look, his look, mic off. <laughs> no, look, uh, it's not crazy to think that there is some experimentation going on here with governments over these whole COVID lockdowns um, and the mask mandates, for instance, um, you know, again, well, just to, to take it back to the debate, it was Joe Biden who said, who's basically saying, you know, we're sick of wearing masks. And, uh, you know, a lot of people in America are sick of that, but Trump yes, who said that. Or Trump who said that. Yes. Sorry. Sorry. But um, yeah, this is a test run. It's amazing to me. And I, I, I cannot believe this is true. Back when, when the lockdowns first began, when it was two, when it was 15 days to flatten the curve, I never would have dreamed that we would still be basically having m m many states on lockdown six, eight months later. And this is because these these governors and these governments, this is this is a test run. How much uh, lockdown? How much suppression of your liberty and your free movement and your life will the American people put up with? I don't even think they thought it would be this this right. long and that people would be this compliant with it. It's frankly really, really scary. And yeah, the next thing is the climate lockdown. If if we're if we're gonna lock down and, and basically put ourselves in caves and and hunker down and just be okay with with huge disruptions in our lives, in our personal lives, not visiting family members in hospitals, not having funerals for our loved ones who passed away while there's huge public funerals for the important people. And there's there's really very little pushback on this. That's where I think the selection is really important. And again, that's where Trump was kind of getting into this sure. in the debate is because I think there's a lot of pent up. I pray to God there's a lot of pent up frustration among people saying that they want to vote against these kind of lockdowns because the climate one is coming next. Yeah. You're absolutely right, Donnie, because, you know, if you think COVID is dangerous, oh, my gosh, 
climate's going to kill everyone. So we have to lock it down. That's absolutely coming. And they know yeah. that they could probably get away with it. Right. And these are the seeds that they're laying down. Justin, absolutely. I want I want your response to this next part, because this should sound very familiar to you. So it says corporate governance must now reflect stakeholders needs instead of shareholders whims building an inclusive sustainable economy depends on productive cooperation among the public and private sectors in civil society this means firms need to listen to trade unions and workers collectives community groups consumer advocates and others likewise government assistance to business must be less about subsidies guarantees and bailouts and more about building partnerships this means attaching strict conditions to any corporate bailouts to ensure that taxpayer money is put to uh, put to productive use and generates long term public value, not short term private property uh, profits. In the current crisis, for example, the French government conditioned its bailouts for Renault and Air France on emission reduction commitments. So uh, so then it kind of just continues on there with this idea of investments and all of that. But. Does that not sound familiar there, Justin? I mean, I think we talked about uh, this when we were talking about the Great Reset and some of these ESG standards not a month ago. Yeah, this is exactly what this is. This is this is this is the Great Reset. This is a Great Reset of capitalism. There's a whole bunch of people out there um, in the World Economic Forum, like Klaus Schwab, my buddy Klaus. <laughs> um, we've got yeah. we've got the head of the United Nations. We've got people at the at the um, International Monetary Fund, uh, CEOs of major businesses, all calling for a great reset of capitalism. And when you read about the great reset, when you read the details of what they're calling for, it is exactly this: it is let's transform our entire let's blow up capitalism as we understand it. Let's create this whole new system that's based on stakeholders, not shareholders. Mm -hmm. Shareholders, by the way, is just another word for saying the owners of something. Uh, we're going to not care about what the owners of a company want. We're not going to care about what the customers want. What we're going to do is care about the collective society, what's good for them. And we're going to shape all these rules and incentives around that. We're going to use our power to print money uh, and funnel that money to the businesses we like who are responsible to the stakeholders and we're going to build this whole new system of, of capitalism around this idea. And it's not really capitalism. It's essentially a form of socialism. And that's what we're going to do. And that's exactly what this person is describing here. And the justification for the Great Reset is climate change. We have yeah. to do this because if we don't do this, there's uh, climate change is an existential threat. Human beings are all going to be wiped off the face of the planet. And so we have to go this, this route. And really, it goes all the way back to um, Naomi Klein. Who, who wrote a book about this very concept several years ago. Um, and, and the name of the book escapes me. But essentially, the entire book was all about how capitalism is completely incompatible with uh, environmentalism. And that if, if we want to save the world from climate change, we have to completely throw out our understanding of economics, stop putting um, uh, profits above people and all this other language that they're constantly using. Um, and, and that's what we're seeing now. This movement is growing. You guys are both right that if the left had it its way, it would already have had these lock, uh, climate lockdowns to save the planet. They would have already done that if they could. The only reason that they haven't done it already is because they don't think people would go for it. And I think what COVID has done is given them a little more hope that maybe people will go for it if they can just convince them that climate change is disastrous enough to justify it. And right. that's what COVID was. People were so scared of COVID that they were willing to do all of these crazy things. Are they afraid of, of, of climate change in the same way that they're afraid of COVID? No, they're not. But that's why they're trying so hard to make people afraid of it so that they can do whatever it is they want to do in order to, quote, solve the problem, including blowing up capitalism, moving to the great reset model of, of economics, uh, putting government in charge of virtually everything. These are all part of the larger plan here. Yeah. And climate change is that key justification, as this writer made very clear in this article. Yeah, no, it's uh, it really ties all the pieces together. This article does. Uh, Isaac, we've got less than a minute here. Giving you final word. What's going on, sir? Chalupa. I zoned out. Yeah, I zoned out because you guys are just yammering on forever. Uh, <laughs> okay, no, we're just, I you think, know. <laughs> I think that if they did try anything like this, that would be enough. I mean, if 
it'd be yellow vests everywhere. Yeah, that's you know what? Yes, I actually really think that. I mean, in France, they're they're right. They were rioting for like a year over like a thirty cent increase to the tax. Uh, I would be out tax. there, like <laughs> I'd be I'd be out in front of the the yellow vest parade. That's for sure. All right. Well, that's where you can find Isaac. Uh, I have a giant inflatable up. fork and knife in each hand, and I'd have like a giant inflatable burger as well. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, yeah, buy this from my cold dead fingers. Right to protest the ban on meat. That's yeah, right. Exactly. All right. All right. All right. That that'll do it for this episode. Thank you everybody for tuning in. Join us every Friday for a new episode of In the Tank Podcast. If you like our show, please subscribe. Write a review for us on iTunes. You can find us pretty much everywhere: Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google, YouTube, pretty much everything nowadays. If you'd like, you could follow us on socialist twitter at in the tank pod you could also send us your comments suggestions questions to the show by emailing us at in the tank podcast at gmail.com justin where can the fine people find you uh they can find me on socialist twitter at justin t haskins and facebook as well at justin t haskins uh they can also email me at j haskins at heartland.org i received this I, I i know we're running late and everything and you have this arbitrary deadline that you always have for oh my God. ending the podcast but i received some hate mail and we wanted, yeah. we, we want to we want to start a new segment called justin's what hate mailbag or something like yeah, that we gotta yeah. come up with a name for it right so this is a perfect example of it this is i was on tucker carlson's show uh last night and i received uh this this wonderful piece of email from kathy i'm not gonna name her last name and kathy says no greeting just why were you screaming on tucker carlson's show question mark you were so frenetic and fulminated so much that I oh. could not understand what you were saying. Was it something about voter suppression question mark, or was it the pandemic at any rate? <laughs> I would recommend some sort of calming med Xanax <laughs> signed sincerely CVS. Oh, nice. nice. Sometimes you do need that though. <laughs> Like sometimes you get way too excited and you know what? I'm on Kathy's. I'm on her side (laughs) here. I'm I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not surprised at all. I I just want to say this to Kathy. I've taken under her advisement. Um, I am, I am looking deeply into my, uh, you know, in my heart and my soul and what kind of person I am. And I just want you to know, screw you. (laughs) <laughs> Jim Likely, Kathy, don't that? let him talk to you like that. He does need to take a chill pill every once in a while. Jim, where can the fine people find you? They can find my fulminated account <laughs> at Jay Lakely on Twitter at Heartland Inst for the Heartland Institute's Twitter account, and always go to Heartland.org. Isaac Orr, final guy. You can find me riding a cow in protest of vegetarianism. All right. Any day of the week. <laughs> Thank you all for tuning in. We'll talk to you. <laughs>